The following is a conversation between Jake Porway, the founder and executive director of DataKind, and Denver Frederick, host of The Business of Giving, on AM 970 The Answer in New York City. There is a growing consensus that the time to use data for social good has arrived. And as much as people acknowledge that, they often don't get too excited by it because the messenger, frequently a data scientist, can get us a little lost in the woods of what they're trying to do. But we have no such worries this evening because my next guest, aside from being an exceptionally gifted data scientist, is also an equally gifted messenger for this revolution. He is Jake Porway, the founder and executive director of DataKind. Good evening, Jake, and welcome to the Business of Giving. Good evening, Denver. Thanks for having me. Before we dig in too deeply about what you do and how you do it, first give our listeners a brief overview of the mission and objectives of DataKind. Well, at DataKind, we seek to harness the power of data science in the service of humanity. And what that means is that we team up data scientists, these uh, statisticians and programmers, to volunteer alongside social organizations to co-create solutions that are going to maximize their impact. Great. Now, let me, before we get into the work that you do, let me start with a very basic question. What is data? What is data to you as a data scientist? What is data maybe to someone working in the social sector? That is such a great question and one that I love talking about because most people that we talk with hear the word data and think of spreadsheets or the matrix or, you know, anonymous zeros and ones. It's a really foreign, impersonal kind of thing. And it's unfortunate that people think of it that way because data is actually so much more exciting. Uh, data is really anything that is digitized, that mm -hmm. is anything that is recorded. And so that means not just your spreadsheets, but that's all of the information coming off of our cell phones about everything we do there. It's about everything on our laptops, like what position the marker is right now in this podcast. That's digital information. That's data. It's uh, satellite imagery. It's all your Fitbit data. Uh -huh. And so we're facing this era where we're coming into now where data that you used to have to go out and hunt. You used to have to be a scientist to go out and record data about the world with your tools and your microscope. Right. Now comes burbling <laughs> up out of every activity that we do that's digital. And so there's now just this endless trove of digital information about our activities and lives that could show us new patterns about ourselves, about our world, and about our communities than we've ever seen before. Well, I want to take this a little bit further. Uh, Jake, you talk about data for humans, and you also talk about data for machines. What is the distinction you're trying to make here? Well, I think it's a really important distinction to make because, again, when people hear data, you often tend to think of the kind of <clears throat> marketing report that you picture uh, someone showing to a big boardroom of a pie chart or mm -hmm. a, a graph of information going up yep. and to the right. And that's because I think so many people use data to try to change someone's mind, to say, hey, let's look – here are what sales are doing, and so therefore you should make a different decision about how you're selling, or uh, here's what's going on in the world, and we're going to show you through the data. And that's very important, mm -hmm. obviously. We use data as a, a way to communicate what's going on in the world all the time. But the really new kind of fundamental opportunity that we have is that with the outbreak of computing, of low-cost computing, the fact that anyone can get a laptop or uh, uh, can has access to cell phone technology, means that you can also feed that data not just to try to make a human make a different decision, but can be fed into computers mm -hmm. that can mine this data, explore it, to find new trends, to understand things in the data that we haven't necessarily seen before. They either allow us to learn something new uh, or do something at scale, you know, and millions of uh, computers doing this across the globe. And just to sort of draw that distinction home, you know, a lot of people, I think, believe that when you, you show someone data, they'll do something different. And there's a great quote by Plato that I'm going to misquote because I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> uh, but it's basically something like, people make their decisions based on emotions, upbringing, and knowledge, or something like that. And, and what I love about that is that I think he put knowledge third for a reason, is that there are so many things that go into our decision making. There are so many emotions and so many fears that if it only took data – we wouldn't have a debate about climate change. We'd all be pitching in to, mm -hmm. to fight back. We wouldn't have a debate over vaccines and uh, autism. There are a lot of human emotions that go into making a decision. So data is just one piece of that. That's the sort of data for humans piece. The data for machines piece can tell you, hey, if you've already made a decision, let's say, for example, that you do agree climate change is, uh, is man-made when you right. do something about it. Computers could help you crunch over terabytes of data to understand what is the optimal intervention. Or if we, you know, do build seawalls, 
what are the simulations and implications that occur, could occur from that? So it's less about using data to change someone's mind because now you're facing behavior change and, and all of the, the political and yeah. ego and social issues that go with that. And instead saying, mm. where are the opportunities to use data and technology to help us see worlds, inform our decisions in ways that we've never seen before, not change our minds, uh, but change our actions. Let me pick up on using data to change people's minds because that really speaks to confirmation bias. People tend to pay attention to data that confirms their view of the world and either ignore or even denounce data <laughs> that does not. I mean, if Fox News comes out with a poll, uh, my progressive friends would say, well, of course it shows that. What would you expect from Fox? And if the New York Times does the same thing, my conservative friends say, of course the New York Times is going to indicate <laughs> that. So the question is, how can data be used in a fact-based, well-designed, uh, objective way to really inform people to make different decisions? Well, I'd say we are notoriously bad as humans at making decisions around <laughs> data. And, and there's a quote that I love that says, uh, if you torture the data enough, it'll confess. <laughs> and, uh, what that means to me is even two seemingly impartial folks could take the same set of data, and depending on what they want to see in it or show in it, can weave any story they want. And I think this is the, the human condition. Yeah. And this is really largely the reason that the field of statistics uh, was born. People recognize that we have this tendency to sort of cherry pick data that confirms what we already believe. And so all the methodologies around statistics and statistical modeling uh, are built with the intention of removing that human factor, mm -hmm. saying if we were to, for example, give you know, half of a, a group of people a drug and another half of uh, people not treat with the drug, do the differences actually not just feel like the drug worked, yeah. but can we sort of say statistically it, it's very likely that repeatedly this has an effect? And so I think the answer to this, although it may sound a little dry, is this increase in the use of not just data literacy but statistical literacy. Uh -huh. Having people sort of understand that that bias is there and that these tools of statistics may help us fight back against them. Let me pick up on DataKind and your initial statement. You are overwhelmed with requests from nonprofit organizations seeking the kind of assistance <laughs> that you provide. Jake, how do you go about selecting which projects your organization is going to be engaged in? And then how do you go about matching up these pro bono data scientists uh, to work on a particular project? It's a, a great question. And I should say that when we're talking about the projects that we work on, DataKind's mission is to help nonprofit and social organizations maximize their impact. Mm -hmm. So if you are a group that is trying to reduce homelessness, we want to see where can data and algorithms help you reduce even more homelessness yep. and make your operations more effective, see things you couldn't have ever seen before that are going to supercharge you. And so with that in mind, when we look for organizations, you know, we're looking for a special kind of organization. So on the surface, we want someone who, of course, has a really good theory of change. They need to be able to show us why it is their activities presumably do, say, reduce homelessness, because only then can we sort of step back and say, well, here's how data and algorithms are going to make that even better. Mm -hmm. If there's a shaky path to success, it can be harder for us to figure out where to jump Got in. you. So there's that. But the other thing that's been so critical for finding the right organization has to do with culture. Like we said at the top of the show, data is dry. <laughs> it, is, it can be scary. We haven't talked about this. Data can be weaponized against people as showing why they shouldn't get funding or why they're not doing well or there's privacy concerns. And so for us, we really look for organizations that want to embrace data as a resource, as a utility, as a tool to give them uh, extra foresight into what's going to happen or extra efficiencies. And that usually requires someone at the top having that kind of uh, entrepreneurial, innovative spirit mm -hmm. saying, look, I want to do this to use data to drive decisions, not just drive what I already know. And I'm willing to face the hard truths. Yeah. If you show me this isn't working, or if we try something that doesn't work, great. That's a learning lesson to me. Nothing more difficult, I think, than creating a data-driven culture, oh, which absolutely. isn't one already. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I find so many organizations that like to use data to basically support what they already have decided to do. Absolutely. And yeah. it's just is is the tail wagging the dog, and you see it all the time. So let's say you pick one of these projects, yeah. uh, based your on your criteria, you get your pro bono um, data scientists to work. You basically do this in three phases. Your first phase mm -hmm. is going to be project scoping, then project execution, and then the third phase will be wrap up and evaluation. Walk us through this process and tell us about how long each one, uh, piece of it takes. Sure. So I think if anyone has been through a, a process of building a, a solution with a partner, like a tech solution or a, a, even just a consulting 
uh, job. You can probably imagine what these phases look like. I know you had Jim Fruchterman on the show from Benetech, mm -hmm. so I'm sure maybe he talked a bit about this, that you know, when you're building anything for someone, you want to understand their problem yep. and scope the problem. You want to build the thing and then see if it worked. Uh, where I think the nuances come in with data science is uh, that we face a couple of interesting challenges that, that highlight uh, in each of these phases. So in project scoping, uh, what we're looking for is understanding you know, where can algorithms that can, again, predict the future or see what's around the corner tomorrow come to bear on the organization's work. And the biggest challenge we face, of course, is that this whole world of data science, though we've been talking about data for decades, the explosion of data and computing has only been, I mean, since 2010, yeah. conservatively, maybe 2007 when the iPhone came out. So what we're facing is a lot of folks that need to, have difficulty understanding exactly what it is they could use. Mm -hmm. So the scoping phase you're talking about is a, really a big dialogue. We'll go in with an organization and say, you know, just tell us about your mission. Let's not talk about the data. Let's see here what your challenges are. And there's a really great kind of one-two like dance that goes on. A little tension the, back and forth. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's a it's a creative, a creative tension, tension, a good one, a healthy one. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we'll bring a data scientist mm -hmm. in with a, a nonprofit, and uh, a classic setup will go like this: a nonprofit will say, "Hey, we've got this data set. Now what?" And the data scientists will go, well, what are your biggest challenges? And they'll say, well, we have trouble figuring out, you know, the, the constituents who come to our homeless shelter. Some, you know, 50% just disappear. Why is that? And the data scientists may say, well, you know, if we took that data about who's coming in the door, and we also combined that with some information about that the city makes available about uh, voucher programs, we might be able to predict uh, who is going to fall off the system. Mm -hmm. And this is usually an, an aha moment, right? <laughs> you know, the social organizations, whoa, whoa, you could do that? You know, I've just been using data to show my funders yeah. or put a, a prospectus together. I could actually use this. Well, if you could do that, have I got an idea for you? And then you just see That's this wonderful right. synergy yeah, where they're yeah. talking about what data is available, what the challenge is, and uh, what can be done with the technology. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I, I focused, I know you mentioned the three phases, but really that scoping Yeah, phase, that project phase uh, is probably, that scoping is the most important and probably the most difficult as well. Absolutely. It's, it's the genesis of the whole uh, project. And one of the, the other challenges to it that I think is important to note is the world we live in today is incredibly decentralized. Mm -hmm. Organizations that are tackling big sector-wide challenges live in a community of people, say, all tackling homelessness. The data around that doesn't necessarily live within each organization neatly contained. There could be data about homelessness in one homelessness organization. There could be data from that the government has made publicly available about social services. There could be, you know, I would just really stretch this, uh, satellite imagery <laughs> of, of people waiting in lines to get into homeless centers. And all of that is data that could be used to bear on the problem. So uh, there's also, you know, that piece. And, of course, the data scientists are locked away in Silicon Valley and Wall Street, so they're working at other organizations. So this scoping process is, really becomes a, a weaving process. Well, let's talk about those data scientists, because the ones that work for you do so on a pro bono basis. And I'm sure you've heard <laughs> what kind of substantive impact can these pro bono data scientists provide with weekend hackathons <laughs> and a bunch of loosely coordinated activities. What's the secret to taking these somewhat unrelated bands of activity and turning them into meaningful engagements that will really advance the work of the nonprofit organization? It's a great question, and I know many people here volunteer pro bono and think low quality or uh, you know low skill level. Um, but our, I have to say the people in this network are anything but. And to actually, before touching on the pro bono piece, I think it's worth talking about what the heck a data scientist is. Yeah, I mean, if okay. I were listening to this, I'd be like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so, you know, because we mentioned there's this new explosion in data and new explosion in computing, Data scientists are the people who can pull all that data together and get computers to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So they're the people who write Netflix's recommendation algorithm that watches everything that people rate, everything they watch, and is yeah. able to crunch all that down and say, hey, you want to watch Notting Hill. Yep. You know, that system and they're right some of the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. No, nothing's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, these folks, they're a very rare breed of both computer programmers and statistic, statistical models. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they're incredibly rare. They're super expensive. And industry has figured out they're valuable because they drive everything from Facebook to Twitter to Netflix to Spotify's yeah. value. So they are virtually unattainable if you don't have a lot of resources. So that's the sort of profile of the, the folks we're, we're talking about. And I might consider myself a data scientist based on my training. And to talk about the pro bono piece of this, I have to sort of tell the story of really how DataCon came into existence. 
and which was that we were, I was sitting around at my first hackathon. Yep. And uh, a hackathon, if, if those for the uninitiated, are these kind of weekend events mm-hmm. where a bunch of technologists, data scientists get together and they just say, hey, what can we build? We've got all this data. We've got all these computers. Let's just build something cool. Yeah. And I thought to myself, going into this room, I thought, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> the people in this room are the most high caliber folks I've met. There's a machine learning expert from Google. Yeah. There's a data scientist from NASA. I thought, man. We've got 48 hours to ourselves. What are we going to build? We could build stuff that could change the world. Mm-hmm. We could build stuff beyond what our bosses or the mm-hmm. government thinks we need. We could, we could build amazing stuff. And in and, and just 48 hours, just 48 hours, we built stuff that was super unfulfilling. Just it felt, it depressed me so much because <laughs> what people built were like apps to go find uh, de- local deals. Or yeah. someone made some app that you know, was supposed to be an improvement on, on – uh, helping you uh, organize your iTunes library. And, you know, you're using this advanced technology, advanced machine learning and, and, and data science. For what? For what? Yeah, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. I, I love that my iTunes library oh, is now sure. organized. But, you know, in the vast problems of the world, that ranks pretty low to me. And I think those was largely because you know, most data scientists, they skew young, they skew wealthy, they skew white male, to be honest. Yeah, sure. And their problems, you know, aren't finding low-income housing. They're finding cheap beer. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> So there's this incredible energy, incredibly high-skilled people getting together on their own volition to build pretty capable things in a short period of time. It felt to me like they just needed a channel to bring that towards social impact causes. Mm-hmm. And what we found was so many of them wanted to be doing that work. It's just those problems aren't as easy, readily available. You can't just dream up a, a new solution to homelessness. You have to spend a lot of time, as we mentioned, talking and working at it. So this is all to say that profile of folk is who we have in our community. They are data scientists from BuzzFeed, Google. They're professors of data science. And sure, when they get together for a weekend, we don't expect them to solve a massive problem. But what we have found is that getting these data scientists together for what we uh, call a data dive, which is like our version of a hackathon, Mm -hmm. where we invite three social organizations with their challenges and their data sets to work together with these data scientists, two really big things happen. The first is that you get a huge number of prototypes, research moments, really aha moments. Yeah. For the Quite, social yeah, and real fast, too. Oh, yeah, and, and crazily fast. <laughs> yeah. Setting up the problem is half the battle. If you've got people coming in with the right challenge and the right data sets, in 48 hours, people can make a ton of progress. Uh-huh. And, you're, and we're talking about everything from building visualizations of stop and frisk in the New York Police Department to building algorithms that predict the urgency of human rights violations mm-hmm. at Amnesty International. This is happening in a weekend. And so really the, the benefit there is that kind of opening the door to social organizations. Like, this is what's possible. Come feel it, touch it. You probably didn't even imagine the age we live in. You're absolutely right. That alone is Hey, I don't think there's been a lot of energy on the demand side because I don't think social organizations even knew this stuff was possible until recently. And it's not just them. <laughs> I, I came from the for-profit industry. Most companies, <laughs> for-profit companies, it, it's not, it doesn't even break social org yeah. for-profit. Like, it, this is all so new. Mm-hmm. Everyone is getting their head Fair around enough. it. Fair enough. It's frontier land. Well, let's talk about a couple of examples, and one that I was particularly impressed with was the work you did with Crisis Text Line. First, tell us what is Crisis Text Line and then how you were able to help them. Totally. Uh, Crisis Text Line is an organization that seeks to counsel uh, teenagers that are in crisis. And they're, they're, they're a fantastic organization going back to how we pick organizations because they're, they not only have a very clear model where they connect uh, uh, teens who are in crisis to counselors via text message, mm-hmm. but they also have a data science spirit from the start. Yep. And Nancy Lublin, who right. is the CEO there, has talked about I know her, this. yeah. Yeah, so you can vouch for this. She, one of her first hires was uh, a data analyst, data scientist, because she said, this is going to be critical. Mm-hmm. So we love groups like that. Um, and the work they're doing is really impressive. You know, teens don't use the old crisis hotlines that you might remember, like the nine line where you would call if you were in, in trouble or suicidal, because teens don't call on the phone. No, they don't use a phone. Don't know how to use a phone. Exactly right. (laughs) To talk at least. Yeah, right. So so Crisis Text Line provides that text-based counseling and meets teens where they're at. And from what I understand, they've now expanded to hundreds of of cities. Yep. So one of the problems they were facing was that there is a class of people who use a service called repeat texters. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that some people will text the service without an urgent concern, and they'll just keep texting back. This is kind of like people who you know, hear stories about people going to the ER because they're lonely or because yeah, it's yeah. you know a, a safe place to be. And, and that's all well and good, but it, it really drains the resources 
that Crisis Text Line could be using to help teens in need. I bet it does. Yeah. And so they wondered, you know, could we use our data? All this data, and when I say data, I mean the literal text messages, the time of the text, the, the words of the text, the behaviors of the people, to understand who is likely to become a repeat texter. Hmm. And so they used to just wait 16 text messages, and if you hadn't said something urgent by then, they said, okay, we're going to push you somewhere else. You're just taking up time. So we teamed them up with a data scientist from Pivotal Labs, and together they crunched the data, they built these statistical models, they wrote algorithms that took all this information in, and then allowed them to see, with just about five texts, about 90% likelihood, who was going to be a repeat texter. And so they could reroute them in that moment way more effectively, and this has led them to believe that they can now serve over 10,000 teens in crisis per year than they could before with the same resource. That's fantastic. I, well, and if you're a nonprofit, you know, big listeners of the show know how resource constrained you sure. are. Sure. Yeah. So if you can save money or time anywhere, that's a And huge better thing. serve your constituency. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. And, and on that note, there was a cherry on top that they even claimed they were getting better reviews from the people, even the repeat texters, saying, yeah. thanks. I didn't want to keep texting back. I wanted to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for handling me more quickly. So it's a great place where, uh, example where data and algorithms made their operations that much better. Throughout the entire system. Oh. Uh, you've also done some interesting work here in New York City with the New York City Parks Department. Mm -hmm. How were you able to help them? I love the Parks Department. If for no other reason than when they talk about New York City's trees, they refer to it as the urban forest. Wow. And I just find that beautiful. What a I, great I, way to I, frame, I, yeah, <laughs> frame it's it. A gorgeous image. I'm already sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poetic. Um, and one of their data challenge was they said, you know, we have a lot of programs we run. We want to keep people safe in the city and the parks well kept. So uh, one of the things we do is we prune tree limbs. So we'll go, we'll see kind of a suspicious tree limb hanging out over the street, and we'll go out, we'll cut it down preemptively to make sure it doesn't fall on somebody or fall on a car and cause damage. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we do this kind of by gut. We know it. We have evidence. We know it works, but can we test that? And the nice thing is that the Parks Department has data about every single tree in that urban forest. Every single tree? And, well, I should, you know, <laughs> fact check me. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Many, many trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they know a lot of really detailed information about when it was planted, what type it is, what treatment has been done to it, if anyone pruned it or anything like that. So they've got this rich database just sitting there, and we team them up with a data scientist, this guy Brian D'Alessandro, who works at an ad company. Mm -hmm. He spends his whole day figuring out if he shows you an ad. Yeah, I'm going to click or not, right? Exactly, you're going <laughs> to click or not, right? Best and, minds in the world trying to figure out whether we're going to click an ad or not. That's right, that's that great <laughs> Jeff Hammerbacher yeah, quote, I'd which remember. is oh, much of the inspiration for what mm -hmm. we do. And so it's great, though, because that same premise, if I show you an ad, will you click or not, applies exactly to this problem. It says, if I prune a tree limb, are there fewer emergencies on this block, actually, or not? And so here you can port a, the same algorithm being used at an ad company mm. with big data right into the social impact challenge. And lo and behold, Brian was able to find that there are actually 22% fewer tree emergencies on these blocks where the New York City Parks Department is pruning these limbs. Keep on cutting. Keep on cutting, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least you've got something to compare against. That is great. Yeah. yeah. And you now see other urban forestry programs writing to New York and saying, whoa, how did you get that number? Can we do this? And we love seeing that because we know that one of these innovations for one organization often has legs elsewhere across the sector. You've also worked with the American Red Cross, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that was a great project that one of our uh, chapters did in D.C. We have a, a volunteer chapter network that does this work. And they teamed up with them to help understand how they could reduce injury and death from fires in homes. There are over 25,000 people every year die in fires that they think could be prevented simply by having a working smoke detector. A lot of people don't have those smoke detectors. And so the Red Cross pledged, we're going to get a million more smoke detectors and free smoke uh, fire alarm education out into America mm -hmm. to, to prevent this problem. But where do you start? How do you begin to just go knock on every door in America? You know, that's, that, there's no way. You chew, chew that's what I would do. Yeah, right? Yeah, same. <laughs> Start with my neighbors. I need these. So they, they you know, could we take a data-driven approach? And so they teamed up with volunteers in, uh, in D.C. who said, let's combine data about the communities that the government makes available. Let's get data about fire-related injuries and deaths that have happened. And from that, they were able to build statistical models that mm. could predict where are the areas that are least covered – just sort of communities that are yeah. least likely to have smoke alarms. Then they went further to say, where are the households where we predict in the future? We think based on past data, we predict these are going to have challenges. That was the second one. And then third, and this is kind of a nuance on the second, where is it most likely 
that if we bring this education program to those places we predict are going to have fires, is it going to make the biggest difference? Yeah. And that's everyone's holy grail, right, is where am I going to have the most impact? Absolutely. And so they built a great fire risk map. It's up and live. You can see it on datakind.org slash blog. You know, it's going to be used by the Red Cross to figure out how to inform their services. And worth noting, started out at one of those weekend data dives. There you go. Where you said, hey, you know, what can happen from that? Well, the team and the Red Cross were so excited by those results in just 48 hours, they kept working together over the next year in their spare time. And lo and behold, this is the result that's going to save American lives all across the country. All great stuff. I'm going to go to a bit of a lightning round with you, Jake, oh, if I it? can. You ready? Sure, I'm Five ready. quick questions. Okay, here we go. You hate word clouds. Oh, do I ever. <laughs> Why? Oh, I don't think we can do this in a lightning round, but I will say this. Data is confusing. You want to communicate data to people in a way that gives them the so what. Mm -hmm. Word clouds to me are like the fast food of <laughs> information communication. They're like deep fried spreadsheets because you look at a word cloud. If you don't know what I'm talking about, they're those big words that you say, you know, Obama's speech said, you know, I don't know, America, biggest in the middle. And you feel good because it looks cool and you can kind of understand it. But beyond knowing what the biggest word is, what do you get out of it? It tells that? you nothing. It tells you nothing. It doesn't tell you anything about the sentences. We don't just speak and, you know, you can't tell what the content of something is just by the most number of words. No, the I colors, look at the colors. Mean, yeah, <laughs> and the colors mean nothing. Oh, it's a, it is a, just a, a disgrace to, inf to actually conveying information. And I, number I two, them. if you were starting a career as a data scientist and had only one program to work with, Ooh. what would be your tool of choice and why? Well, for the stats nerds out there, I cut my teeth on R, mm -hmm. and it's going to offend everyone that has ever trained me or known me to say that I think I would say Python. Wow. Yeah, it's a general purpose language. You can program most things as well as do statistical computing. Start there, and then work your way up to R. Uh, at Datakind, you have a no-jargon rule. How did that get started, and how do you enforce it? Oh, great question. <laughs> well, we do use a uh, patented NJR system. That mm -hmm. is the no-jargon rule system. I'm kidding. We basically make sure we get rid of acronyms across yeah. the board. Uh, the rule came into practice because our world is bringing together data scientists and social organizations. They've got their own terms that neither one knows. Mm -hmm. There are very few people, as uh, Henry Timms from the 92nd Street Y pointed out, who know what both an API and the SDGs are. Yep. And if, if you're scratching your head, that's because you're probably on one side of the other. Yeah. So we say... Well, I think a lot don't know both. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair enough, exactly. <laughs> so, man, no one wants to be the dumb one and you know, feel like they have to raise their hand. Well, what is that? So we try to do that for yeah, you. Yeah, no, I've always put my uh, phone under the table and looked it up. You know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> so nobody knew I didn't know what it was. Right on. What is the coolest or one of the coolest data maps you have ever laid your eyes on? So I'm so dry about this. There's so many flashy, cool mm. data maps out there. But I always go back to the practical. And I actually think of the old uh, John Snow cholera map. Mm -hmm. And if people aren't familiar, it's a very, very old map during the cholera outbreaks in London. Yeah, that's people, right. Yeah, people are like, how do we stop this? And uh, so, He started data science with that. You know, that a lot of, yes, a yeah. lot of people claim it. Exactly. He said, well, you know, let's just plot on a map of London where cholera is happening, and he found this real density right around this one water pump. Water and, pump, that's exactly yeah, and right. And they went and pulled off the handle, and it, it's still standing there as a testament to data saving lives. And fifth question, yeah. final question, something significant that you've changed your mind about in the last five years? Ooh, that's a great one. Uh, I would have to say, you know, I have really come around on... Uh, I have to say, you know, believe it or not, on this big data thing. Hmm. Funny, when I was uh, coming into it, I, I was trained very much that you, you build models with you know, as little data as possible, and it's so, it's almost a badge of pride if you yeah. can build a, a computer system that learns just a little bit of data. Uh, and lo and behold, having way more data is way more helpful, and you can learn much more about the world. So I've switched over. Uh, you know, that's, that's really a, a kind of wonky thing for the tech nerds out there. but uh, It's an important one. It, it was a big one for me, for sure. Getting back to Datacon, you're a nonprofit organization. You've been growing fast. You're spreading your wings across the world. What's your funding model? How do you generate your revenues? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, we are a mix of foundation funding and corporate funding. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, what we are actually funding, by the way, is, uh, you know, we have about uh, 12,000 volunteers across our globe. We have these six volunteer chapter networks. And what we seek to do, of course, is in each of those worlds, bring together data scientists and social organizations to co-create these solutions that make them better, and really ideally bubble those solutions up from just one-off projects to things that might help the sector. And so we really lean on foundation funders for that unrestricted funding of, I mean, of course, who doesn't? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. <laughs> there's not a, I mean, there's not a lot of, if any, data science funding for nonprofits, so we really fill that need. Mm -hmm. If you're going to 
you know, be able to innovate with this expensive resource. And you kind of, kind of one of the few games in town. But we also think of our foundations as partners, true partners. And we have this kind of ethos of reciprocity at Datakind. It's not just, hey, just pay us for this project. We'll tell you how it goes. We're all figuring a lot of this out together. So we'll work with foundations and say, hey, we, you know, please fund us to do this work. But also, we want to know how do your grantees, how could your mission be improved by this? What are you seeing out in the world? There's a smart way to do it. Well, I, I think it's the only way. Yeah, the only way to do it is right. We know data and tech. I'm not an expert in female black leadership in communities. I'm not an <clears> expert in homelessness in uh, various cities. We need, it's not just a, a funding relationship. It is a true partnership. Uh, and we feel the same about corporations who on the other side have data and technology resources that could be giving back to social good. And so the same way they all fund projects or fund data kinds work. And we say, hey, you know, come aboard. What resources can you bring to the fight? You just mentioned a second ago you have chapters around the world, six of them. Yeah. Where are those chapters, oh. and uh, how do they further your mission, and are you thinking of other additional chapters? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, the, the chapters are really, in a lot of ways, the backbone uh -huh. of our, our growth. Uh, the chapters are they're in D.C., San Francisco, Bangalore, Singapore, the U.K., and Dublin. Wow. Yeah, kind of mm -hmm. got a, a good spread there. Yeah, you sure do. Time zones are a pain in the butt, <laughs> but well worth it. Uh, and they're really, they're volunteer-led chapters. So they do what we do at the headquarters here in New York in connecting data scientists and NGOs in their own communities, but with their own special flair. You know, the NGO scene in Bangalore, completely different than what you'd see in D.C. Skill sets of data scientists vary across the world. So it's this great, vast learning network, and the work coming out of them is just incredible. Uh, and you see so many projects coming out where they are bringing together these incredible people we would never have access to otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, and organizations that are making big strides in building these projects together. We are thinking of, we, of course, we want to expand our chapter network. We're trying to grow well. Yeah, so and to, smart. That's right. Of course. So uh, we will, the applications are not open now, but we were always scouting for future Datacon chapter leaders. So I have seen you speak a number of times, and you are a great data storyteller. Oh, thank you. Which is a bit of an oxymoron, I think, <laughs> to a lot of people because, you know, for most people in the social sector, Jake, they'll tell you to get your point across, you have to have great stories about your work, and then you have to back up those great stories with data. Never would they ever think that data and storytelling could go together. Mm -hmm. But you have proven that they can. What is the secret of being a great data storyteller? I am humbled and certainly consider myself much lower on the ranks <laughs> of data storytelling than folks like maybe Jer Thorpe, who's a, a great data artist in this space. Uh, data artist, that's cool. Oh, it's the coolest <laughs> title. I'm <laughs> so jealous of it. Give I, up I, founder and executive director. Oh, oh, data artist. Seriously, right? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I don't know how he came up with that one, but it's great. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, I think that you're right. People think of, of data and, you know, there's not a lot you can see in a spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. I think the key to good data storytelling, aside from the stuff that you'll read where, of course, you want to find the right, uh, you know, medium for your data storytelling. You know, we could talk about the design specifics. I think more than that, it is that data is best telling a story when you are looking at it actually as a process. When uh -huh. you're the storytelling all along the way, not just of, hey, I got this number, 55% people uh, improve in my program and now I'm going to put it in bold font and, and show a graph. That's the kind of data storytelling I think people think of where it comes at the end. Yep. I think the best data storytelling is when you are showing what's happening along the way. I want to see how students are progressing along that path. I want to know what are you learning from that. I mean, that's really when data is almost in the background. And what you're doing is, is carrying people along the path of your mission. Mm. You're bringing them to some new enlightened understanding, and I think data plays a deep role in that. But it is it really gets to shine not just when it's sort of packaged at the end, but when it allows people, it elucidates and allows people to see what goes on in your work and what the real impact is. Yeah, they feel like they're a participant in it in that way as opposed to reading a bunch of recommendations at the end, which is a lot more of a passive activity. The other, they're a little bit more actively engaged. Absolutely, and it's easier said than done. This is yeah. the hardest part of this. We could do a whole different podcast on that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me close with this. And, you know, we were talking about the data revolution that's going on right now, but I think to put it into some kind of context that will allow people to understand its significance, why don't you share with our listeners how this is just the latest development in a line of tools that helped us understand our world better. It's a thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's needed. And I'll just emphasize again, like we said at the top, when people hear data, they're thinking they got to report to their funders. I got to collect data to show I'm making a difference. It's this 
real kind of uh, survival feeling. Mm. I've, I've got to have data, but I also have this love-hate relationship with data. It's used against me. It's numbers. I hated math. Like doing your taxes. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? It's, it's the account. It's the gross stuff. And that's such a shame because we are, without exaggeration, at this new era of data and understanding about the world. Mm-hmm. I often say we're almost potentially at a new age of reason. Yeah. And the way that I, I've summed this up, I actually borrowed this from a guy, Moritz Steffener, that I saw use this analogy and I loved. There was a book called The Macroscope. Right. I think it was 1979. That's this right. Guy, yeah, mm-hmm. Joel de Rosnay came out and he said, you know, throughout time immemorial, humans have built technologies to see the unknown. So you think back to the far reaches of human history, we first built the telescope. Yeah. And that allowed us to see the stars and the galaxies and, and we see the infinitely great. Mm-hmm. And that allowed us to learn more about our place in the universe than, than we ever do before, right? So huge advancement in human knowledge. And then you go ahead, we, we invent the microscope, and that allows us to see the infinitely small you know, microbes and bacteria, and we make huge advances in human health and medicine. Again, humanity overall learns and becomes a, a, it's a new face. Uh-huh. And so he was opining and saying, you know, it's 1979 now. So, you know, what we're missing, though, what we really need is like a, a macroscope, something that yeah, helps us see the infinitely complex, <clears throat> the patterns of society and of nature that are not observable by the naked eye. And... While he could only hope for it, we are now in that macroscope age. That data about nine billion tweets of people in you know around the world expressing their interests or, or interacting with each other—it's there. It's credit card transactions, migration patterns—we have instrumented the world so rapidly and so suddenly that we have given ourselves the macroscope. And data science, these algorithms and statistical models that can help make some sense of that. Yeah, what does it all mean? Yeah, yeah. it is to me this, this new moment that allows us to see things we've never seen before about the way we work. And so that's the promise of this age. Forget the spreadsheets. <laughs> forget the matrix and binary. It is the chance to see ourselves in ways we've never seen before. That's a great way of looking at it. So how do people listening get involved? What do nonprofits do to apply for some assistance? How do data scientists who want to become pro bono volunteers become part of the DataKind team? And where do people go if they want to financially support this work? Fantastic questions. Uh, so the easiest way is to go to datakind.org and go to Get Involved. If you're a social organization that thinks you could use data science, uh, even just wants to know if, come aboard. Sign mm. up. And just fill out a few questions. You do not need to know much, honestly. The, that's our job. We know, like we said, <laughs> this stuff is all new. We'll talk you through it. Data scientists, if you want to give back, in your spare time, come aboard to the same site. And if funders want to get involved, of course, we always ask foundations to reach out, uh, either if you want to just go to the donate page or, like I said, a foundation to come. And can individuals give? Yes. Yeah, so, sorry, individuals yeah. can give, thank you, on the donate page. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, or foundations or corporations, please get in touch with us on the, the contact page. Uh, we have an ambitious mission uh, in that we want to bring data science services to hundreds of organizations over the next few years to really move these social issues forward. So please come join us in this fight. It's going to require everyone. Sounds great. Well, Jake Porway, the founder and executive director of DataKind, thanks so much for appearing on the show. My pleasure. You have a wonderful gift to actually make all this stuff sound like fun. (laughs) It is fun. All while helping to change the world for the better. It was a great pleasure to have you on the program. It was totally my pleasure. Thanks so much. The Business of Giving can be heard every Sunday evening between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern on AM 970 The Answer in New York and on iHeartRadio. You can follow us at BizOfGive on Twitter and at Facebook.com slash Business of Giving.